welcome back to the Purple Cloud Podcast. Today's guests are both Chinese medical doctors trained in Taiwan, Tsai Ling Yi and Chen Po Tsun, who have now both entered the world of academia, completing studies in the field of the history of traditional Chinese medicine, both currently engaged in their doctoral research. In our discussion, we talk a lot about the training of Chinese medical doctors in Taiwan and how this compares in other parts of the world. I chime in a little bit in my experiences of training both in the West and in mainland China. We also talk a little bit about the COVID response in Taiwan and how it's been handled there and exactly how much Chinese medicine has played a role in that. I think it's a really fantastic discussion to get insight into perspectives on Chinese medicine in different parts of the world and it, specifically the educational systems and how they differ, how they overlap and the feelings of the students who have undergone training in these systems. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. Okay, so I'd like to welcome uh, Tsai Lingyi and Chen Po Tsun to the podcast today, who are both uh, trained Chinese medical doctors from Taiwan. Is that correct? Yes. 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 And Po Tsun is now in Manchester and Lingyi is still in Taiwan. Have I got that right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Awesome. Well, I've... <laughs> I've invited them on the podcast today to talk a little bit about the situation of training of doctors in Taiwan. I did my training in mainland China, so I'm very interested to hear the differences and any similarities uh, that have gone on. But first, maybe you could introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about how you got into the field, how you both started to study Chinese medicine and uh, what your experiences were. Uh, should I start first? Or yeah, yeah, you? go for it. Uh, go for it. Go for it. Lady, lady first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What a gentleman. Uh, I, I, I am, uh, I graduated uh, in 2014 and now I am a registered Chinese medical doctor in Taiwan. So I think I already uh, work as a Chinese medical doctor and for a while. And um, I, I, I first graduated from pharmacy school. So I was a pharmacist in, uh, when I uh, graduated from four year university. And then I uh, entered the uh, post baccalaureate study for the Chinese medicine. So um, I will talk about this uh, education system later. So um, the the four year in pharmacy is like a, my first uh, uh, my first major, or say I my university, and then I study the Chinese medicine for five years, and. So that's how I get into the Chinese medicine. And actually I'm pretty interested in the Chinese medicine field when I was in, in university, but actually in my pharmacy uh, profession, we don't learn too much about the Chinese medicine. I just personally get interested uh, for the, for the um, I can say magic, in, in my imagination for mm. the Chinese medicine. So I would like to um, try to enter a different uh, profession and to be a Chinese medical doctor um, as my profession. And also I'm really uh, interested in the Chinese medical classics. So uh, I study the uh, history uh, after 
my graduation from Chinese medical school. And for like four years, I finished my master's thesis and studied the uh, Han medicine, the Chinese medicine in Taiwan in, in the early Japanese colonial era. And so that's pretty much how um, a, a simple introduction for myself mm. now. We'll let uh, Po Tsun <laughs> give an introduction, but I'm, I'm also interested in your dissertation. It sounds quite fascinating. We can touch on that later. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, and hello everyone. My name is Po Xun Chen. And uh, I'm, I'm the another way of the, tradi- of the traditional Chinese medicine education. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in the, I, I'm graduated from the double major uh, degree of the Chinese medicine and also the Western medicine or biomedicine me, uh, medicine. So I have, I have two licenses and this is the one of the particularly uh, method when to get the, to get the Chinese medicine uh, license in Taiwan. And then I'm, and got my master's degree in the STS, the Social Study of Science and Technology in Yangming University. And then I'm now study the, the history of medicine in the University of Manchester. And uh, let me introduce about the, what the double major uh, traditional medicine and biomedicine in Ta- the state, the education in Taiwan. Uh, in my university, in my college, we we have we have to we have to uh, spend eight years in in the university. So we learned the the Chinese medicine when I was in the when when we were the uh, first year and second year in the university. So we studied the for example Huang Di Neijin and the matern, Materna Medica and the prescription decoctions, and also the Wen Bin Tiao Bin, et cetera. And in the third year and fourth year, we are, uh, I think it's totally for the Western medicine. We have to uh, uh, learn the uh, autonomy and especially to practice ourselves in the lab, in, in, the, in the anatomy lab. And, then the pathology and the epidemiology also, also in our uh, must, uh, our, our our lectures, and then for the five, the fifth year and sixth year, I we were the we were the clerk we are, uh, we were the clerk in the biomedicine uh, courses, especially in the in in. Medical center for the training of clerkship in biomedicine, and the seventh year, seventh year is the uh, internship of biomedicine, and the last year in our in my university, back to the we're back to the back to the Chinese medicine uh, department in the in the medical uh, center, so. I think this is the longest uh, education in, in Taiwan for eight, mm. eight years. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so, so both of you have had quite a significant training in both Western medicine and Chinese medicine. And I'd yeah. be quite, yes. yeah, quite fascinated to hear your opinions on how you, how, to what extent you keep them separate in your brain and have two minds when approaching these things or how much they blend over. Cause even, mm. even the people I find who say, Oh, I'm doing classical medicine and this kind of thing, you can't ignore Western medicine. Mm. Um, but I also see people who perhaps have gone too far into the Western, uh, from my opinion. And uh, mm. like in, in China, they do acupuncture, they kind of ignore the the meridian systems and are just doing oh. based on oh. the nervous system. So mm. they've kind of oh. let go let go of that sort of theory and have gone in in a complete. So I'm just wondering. So there's there's all kinds of things, but I, there's always a melding of the two in some way. Mm. So I'm very curious to hear what you have both, how you've both <laughs> navigated this these two different fields. Um, I. 
I have to say, um, in because we have uh, this particular education system, that is, uh, we have to study uh, a lot of Western medicine in our compulsory courses. Also, uh, a lot of uh, the Chinese medical courses. Um, actually, in my opinion, we have more uh, Western medical subjects than the Chinese medicine subjects. Uh, so I will quickly um, uh, introduce a little bit the two major system. First is the Boshin School, which is the you graduate from high school and then you enter the university. Now is reduced to seven years if you are double majored. Yeah. And if you are single major uh, university student, there's also single major system. Uh, they study also seven years. And mm -hmm. the, uh, just as he say, they need to study maybe four years at schools and or five years depends your double major actually you have less time st study at school because they need to follow the two year clerkship in Western medicine in hospitals yeah. and one year internship in Chinese medicine. So if you are a um, single major, actually you have more time to study at school. And for us, we are a post, uh, post bachelor uh, system. So we enter our study uh, first is the anatomy. It's not Chinese medicine. So oh. we spend so much time uh, to study anatomy in the very beginning. And we feel very difficult because maybe in the past, uh, we, we enter this program uh, by the uh, individual entrance exam. So you can come from any profession. You don't need to be a medical student. You don't need to be any biology related uh, student. You can be a history student. You can study finance or something else. And so for them, the course gets so difficult. It's not because of the Chinese medicine, but for the anatomy and pathology, physiology, all the uh, Western medicine subjects. And after about two years, study in those Western uh, subjects, you start to uh, shift your mind to the classics, to the Chinese medicine. So it's a bit chaotic for the students. And they, they then realize they need to, um, to view everything in a different perspective. They need to start to uh, get used to the uh, uh, meridian, the qi, and the blood, and uh, what is the qi deficiency, what is the blood stagnation, and how to treat those uh, problems. So uh, I think for us, the education system didn't provide us an answer for how to blend the two systems together. You need to... Uh, to figure out for yourself. And actually uh, the exams is separated. So if you answer the Western medical subjects, you, you just think about all the scientific facts, all the uh, things you, you learn from the textbook, from the lecture. And if you uh, answer the Chinese medicine subjects, you have to uh, memorize, recite those classic, and uh, it's a lot of mem memorizing. Uh, what's the combination for each decoction? What's the exact text from the Shang Han Lun? So I think it's it, everything you need to figure out by yourself. And for me, I gradually try to uh, combine the Western medical uh, physiology, pathology to uh, just a simple relation to the um, Chinese medicine. It is maybe after my graduation, I start to work, start to do clinical uh, practice, and I can do a little bit, just like 
baby steps to uh, try to combine those two systems together. So it's not an easy task for me to uh, get used to the, the two tracks. Um, that's how I feel now, yeah. Mm. Okay, and I, I agree with uh, Lin's uh, uh, argument that the combination of Chinese medicine and Western medicine is, is when we are doing our clinical practice, especially our independent uh, clinical practice. And I share my experience that when I was in the public hospital uh, as a as an independent of uh, TCM doctor, I started to realize that how to use these two kind two systems in the in the clinical practice. Uh, I I have I have shared this uh, experience with with my friends who is in the uh, 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 physiologist. Um, I, I, I described this, uh, I described this, uh, just like two drawers. I, when we were in the college, we learned the anatomy and I put it into the, into the Western medicine's drawers. And then I, when I learned the Huang Di Nanjing, I put it into the traditional Chinese medicine's drawers. And when I started to, uh, in the in my clinic, in my clinic, I started to uh, talk and discussion with my patients. Uh, I I I graduated to realize how to use uh, different these two drawers uh, as a tool to explain the 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 condition of in the the disease condition to to my patients and also give gave the the advice, for example, for the stroke, for the stroke patients, I could, I could tell him that, oh, I can prescribe the formula, for formulation to treat your, to accelerate your um, blood circulation, and also use my, use the acupuncture to uh, improve your energy, especially for the cheese fluids. And after that, I recommended you to the uh, rehabilitation department. And there they, they could uh, teach you or provide you the more long-term because in, in the Chinese medicine treatment, we cannot stay all, all my day with my patients. But in the rehabilitation uh, department, they, they could teach some uh some some exercise when when they are in in their home or teach their uh families to do the do the simple um uh, simple extraction to 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 their to to the patient so in my opinion i i try i think this two system is is not the not not the conflict that in it's the combination and the work together in in my in my in my clinical practice. Mm, that's really that's really great to hear because I think most people who have studied have done some degree of Western medicine. I don't think mm. even in China we did do anatomy and we did have some um, cutting up corpses and stuff, but I think mm. nothing 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 to the degree you guys seem to have done it. My degree was only uh, five years, not, not seven, but um, yeah, I'm, I think even in Australia and in America, they're yeah. still 40 degree, 40%, 50% Western medicine, mm. most courses yeah. for, for legal reasons, but yeah. you know, you get people as well. I'm curious, like something, some, something will come up in Western medicine and people will often say, well, the Chinese knew about this mm. and, there's often a, a reductionism, like like when the mesentery came came up as a uh, new organ a few years ago, and everyone, a lot of people in the West were saying, "Oh, it's the Sanjiao, it's the same thing." Yeah. I always hesitate to make that line. Oh, it's it's exactly the same thing, you know, because there's. Uh, 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 it, I I always find it a bit blurry. I find it interesting to make these comparisons, 
but I'm mm. always uh, hesitant to really, really jump in and say, oh, they were just explaining this physiology or they were just explaining this because because the differences in philosophy were so great. Um, I'd yeah. like to know your opinions because you guys would have had to th- think about this a lot over the years, I'm sure, this kind of thing. Yeah, I, I will tell my patients that in the Chinese medicine's point of view, your your disease, your condition is blah blah blah. And if and in the Western medicine's uh, opinion, they will tell you that your uh, diagnosis is blah blah blah, and you will uh, get through the treatments for uh, rehabilitation or the operation or after the uh, surgery. We the Chinese medicine could provide what 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 else uh, treatment for you. Yeah, I in, in the clinical practice, I uh, these two systems is, became my tool to describe to explain the the condition. Also for making the strategy for individuals uh, treat uh, therapy. Mm, so even in Taiwan. Um, in, in Australia where I practice now, I do, I, I don't use much Chinese medicine language at all. I try and talk about the concepts to my patients and break them down, but I, as much as possible, I try and put it in language they're familiar with. Mm. I thought it might be a bit easier in Taiwan because you have the culture there and you could, you yeah. could u- use some of these terms in Chinese medicine and people would understand them more easily. But I don't think I will talk too much about the Chinese medical terms. Okay. To, yes, because I believe for them, uh, for example, I I can say you have a cold. Uh, it's because uh, it probably because of the 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 coldness, han qi, mm-hmm. or probably because the feng, the wind. It's the Chinese medical term. They can somewhat um, agree with me, but I won't talk more than that. I I I will not say you are Feng Han. I yeah, right. would not say that. <laughs> okay. But I would say in the more uh, like um, casual language with them. Yeah. Uh, say uh, probably you got cold because it's hot summer and you use too much air con, the temperature is too low and uh, you know there's always virus in our body. So it's obvious if the temperature is low, lower and your immune system uh, gets weak and that's the moment you, you the virus start to proliferate and uh, you get yeah. you get ill so i will try to explain uh the the combine some casual language and a little bit of the chinese med- medical terms and just communicate with them okay yeah. so quite similar approach <laughs> yeah. yes I think. okay okay that's uh really interesting so talk to me a little bit more about yeah the the training and specifically I'm not quite sure how Chinese medicine and the Western medicine sit together in, in Taiwan. And you guys have both really understand the history of it as well and how they've mm-hmm. kind of developed together. Um, so I'm, I'm quite curious to hear about that because I think it is quite unique. Mm. So should we start with like the current situation now? Yeah, sure. Like, like, like how, what, what we can talk about uh, mm. the current situation with COVID because you've done um, your uh, dissertation was on the, yes, the plague, for exam- example. Uh, so that, black, yes. I mean, and there must be some sort of overlaps, overlaps mm. going on there between what was happening back then with biomedicine mm. and now and all of that kind of thing and what's been happening in Taiwan with COVID. Sure. Um, because my study, my master thesis was uh, is about the plague in Taiwan during the early Japanese colonial era. But I would like to say um, the Japanese colonial time 
actually the 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 medical technique, the medical knowledge, um, probably didn't survive till now because uh, there there's different regime uh, shift from Japanese to the uh, nationalists, um, the KMT government. So uh, because the policy, Japanese didn't allow the Chinese medical doctor, Han medical doctors to have their license uh, in the following years. So in the end of Japanese colonial period, uh, there's actually not many uh, Chinese medical doctor exist in Taiwan. Mm. So of course, in the past, uh, in the early probably 1900, the Han medical doctor, Han Yi, they worked together with uh, the public doctor, Gong Yi, and they have their own uh, clinic or say uh, plaque quarantine hospital using Han medicine, and they use the herbal drugs to treat the plaque patient. But actually those hospitals are uh, act as the quarantine hospital. So um, it's not the regular hospital. They uh, accept all types of patients. They only uh, receive the plaque patients. So it's very uh, special um, for specific purpose at that time. And if we are talking about now the COVID uh, pandemic, actually, I believe the Chinese medical doctors now, they do a little bit of treatment for the patient, but they uh, receive patients by themselves. So if you get COVID, you feel the need, you, you want to uh, use Chinese medicine to treat yourself, you can connect to the local uh, Chinese Medical Doctors Union uh, or association, and they can refer you to the, uh, for example, uh, Taipei, uh, clinical medical doctors. So there's a, there's a system working now in Taiwan. Like if you, you, if you want to use Chinese medicine, there it's available. Uh, but if you, you are a very, in a very serious condition, for example, you need uh, oxygen, you are, you need um, more medical treatment, then you will be sent to the hospitals. And for the Western medical doctors, they will give you the proper treatment, but they probably would not include Chinese medicine in their, uh, in their treatment. So it, it really, depends on how, what level of your illness is. If you are minor condition, you can go to the Chinese medicine. If you are so ill, um, probably you won't have the chance to receive any Chinese medical treatment because you, you will send to the hospital. That's how it works now, yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh as the Lin Yi said that uh, TC, uh, traditional medicine and the Western medicine cooperate to treat the to to, to treat the plague is the in, in the Japan colonial period that is the I think it's the inception it's just the beginning but generally speaking Chinese medicine was was suppressed uh, in this uh, Japan colonial period in uh, about 50 years. But I, uh, I have to say the turn, turning point is the, after the Second World War, the Republic of China, they, they took over the political power of Taiwan. And at that time, the KMT, the National, Nationalist Party, they retreated from China to Taiwan and also transport the 
uh, they transport the Chinese people and also the medical regulation to Taiwan. So the we, if if we as we know the 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 abolishment of uh, national medicine in the early twentieth century in China, that's that conflict that phenomena also uh trans uh, transmitted or uh, also transport to Tai. Taiwan after the Second World War. So at that, that time, um, the in Taiwan, the Western medicine is more, uh, although the Western medicine is more high, higher emphasis in the, in the uh, medical systems, but during the anti-communism uh, uh, phenomena at that time, the KMT, they, promote, they promoted uh, a movement called the Chinese culture Re renaissance movement. They argued that we have to uh, revive or rejuven rejuvenate the Chinese culture, the Chinese history, and also the Chinese medicine is in that project. Now, so in, in, that, in that project, so in that project, they invited uh, Joseph Nathan who was All right. uh, yeah? Who who was very very uh, famous uh, historian of science? The the Chen Li Fu, who, yeah. he invited the uh, Joseph Ni Ni Hen to visit Taiwan in 19, 1984. and that's during the period between in, in the Renaissance movement from the the movement is from nineteen sixty six to nineteen ninety one. So after the visiting of uh, Nidhan in the 1984, the, 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 move, the committee of the movement, they set up a special group called the Chinese Medicine and Western Medicine Collaboration and Promotion Committee. And that, so uh, I think that today's uh, collaboration, integration and collaboration between two medicine medical system is from that period. And in that period, they try to do, they, they set up some uh, very interesting uh, clinical trial. For example, the liver disease, especially for the hip, 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 uh, liver cancer. And also in the 1980s is the big pandemic of AIDS, AI, the, the HIV. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and that, uh, special group also set up the, the small clinical trial. They try to use the acupuncture and the, and the herbs to treat the, the HIV uh, patients, not only in Taiwan, but also in the California and the Hawaii. Yeah, so I think that this uh, cooperation between two systems in the medical center is uh, starting from the 1980s in Taiwan. Yeah. So they've, but the Western, um, at least recently in recent years, the Western medicine has always been quite involved and more, yeah. of, and more of a dominant medical. Yeah. Uh, Western medicine always dominant in, in tai, Taiwan. Uh, I think it's uh, part, 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 uh, risk, uh, part, reasons for the colonial uh, uh, period. And also, and then after the Second World War is caused by the, the, the US Americans uh, influence, for example, the aid from the U, uh, Uni United States is also uh, may play the key role in the, in rebuild the, the medical systems after the war, yeah. And in your in your treatments, are you using mostly Chinese medicine methods mm. such as herbs and acupuncture, or are you also incorporating Western medical methods, or are you referring that on to other doctors, or how how's it manifesting in your practice? Okay, uh, that's also because uh, owing to the regulation in the in they call it the night national health insurance uh, in the the authorities they they say that uh, if first for me i have to license the chinese medicine 
and the Western medicines. So I can practice both of these uh, technique. However, the insurance only embarrassed one of it. So if I, my license is, uh, is registered the Chinese medicines. So the, the insurance could cover my, my herbs, my acupuncture. But if I uh, do the, uh, the, simple, the simple surgery or I prescribe the aspirin, that, that, that is the patient should pay the, pay the, the, the fee themselves. Mm, it's okay. not covered, yeah. And, and on the other side is if I register that as, as the Western medicine, my Chinese herb, the decoction and the maxibuction are are the are, are not not covered by the insurance. So that's some. Uh, I think it's a. It, it's not that. Uh, it's it's I, I, ironic cause because because I have two licenses. I have I have two uh, professionsy, but but I I the nice the states only recommend one one of my my technique one of my kind of mm. technique. Yeah. But I want to add that uh, in Taiwan, most uh, Chinese medical doctors, they use only uh, scientific Chinese medicine, which yeah. is the powder form for the, uh, the co co concentrated Chinese powder. Concentrated. Con concentrated powder. So they will combine the compound decoction and single drugs and to mix them into um, 12 grand or 15, uh, 15 grand daily. And uh, you just give your patient maybe three times a day. And that's the major uh, way to practice with so-called internal medicine in Taiwan. If, you, uh, if the patient want the traditional decoction, they want to boil the decoction themselves or uh, use the traditional form, they need to pay by themselves because the health insurance is not covered. And also we use acupuncture a lot. And I would say the acupuncture and tra uh, traumatology is the major field for our practice in our uh, daily clinical uh, setting. Because um, uh, in the past, uh, the health insurance want to decide the percentage for the Chinese medicine. And at that time, there are not many Chinese medical doctors. Uh, so they, uh, they use uh, a lot of Tui Na Shi, the uh, technician for the massage. No. They, to help them to enlarge their, uh, their, their practice so they can get the more percentage from the health insurance. So, uh, but right. actually the percentage is like a 4% or 3.5 something in the whole health insurance. So uh, most people go to the Chinese medicine, they want to re uh, relieve their muscles because they have um, sore, soreness in some places shoulder, uh, back pain, they sprain their ankle. So we, in, in our daily life, we are treating those uh, problems by uh, needles, or you can use some uh, chiropractic manipulation and some of our uh, the post bachelor Chinese medical doctors, they know uh, physiotherapy from their previous profession. So they know how to manipulate and probably they learn from other teacher and they do a lot of the manipulations. So that's the current situation now in, in Taiwan. And outside, this is all within the system and it doesn't sound like raw herbs are used very much at all. Um, no. Yeah. Out, outside of the system, are they still people who've had, for example, a family lineage of this kind of thing. Um, is this, you know, and they, they, they do things maybe in a more folk medicine type style or this kind of thing. How prevalent is this still in Taiwan? 
Yeah. Um, uh, you want to talk about the special exam? The, uh, there, there was a special exam for people who have the knowledge for Chinese medicine, but the exam ends in 2011. So there's no more special exam for them to uh, become, uh, to, to be the Chinese medical doctor only by uh, examinations. So now every Chinese medical doctor, they need to finish their de degree. They need to uh, study mm. everything. So, um, but still, because the exam ends in 2011, so still there are 10% of the current Chinese medical doctor in Taiwan are from the special exam. So, uh, but if you, uh, if you don't use this method, if you are not a uh, special exam doctor, you, you are not uh, able to get licensed now. So uh, if you still practice or write some prescription for your family member, for your friend, that's uh, illegal, basically. <laughs> Uh, yeah, right. we call it we call it Ni Yi, the secret doctor that okay. is un unlicensed. And in the perspective of policy, the in 1995, the the beginning of the health insurance, they 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 only recom uh, recommend the concentrated powder. It, they, their excuse is that the the concentrated powder is more standardized and uh, more uh, scientific to measure and to regulate and to management. So that's only the, 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 the pharmacists, uh, pharmaceuticals that covered by the insurance. So uh, uh, as you mentioned, the crude drug, the herbs is not, uh, not in the uh, health insurance systems but we people can prescribe uh, themselves in the in the folklore medicines. So for, uh, in Taipei, there's a famous street called the uh, Qin Chao Xiang, uh, Green Grass uh, uh, A Ali. Yeah, uh, at, at that at, at that area, there uh, it, it, we we can call it dispensaries. Yeah, the the both of the of the dispensaries. They have the you 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 say the family lineage uh, knowledge about the grass and how their uh, fun function how how their function are, but they 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 just say that they these are folklore medicines and this is for the for promote your health not for treatment. However, in fact, people uh, people when they have some uh, uh, some discomfort. They'll go there first to 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 treat or to find some way to release relieve their 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 discomfort first. Then when when they cannot uh, when they cannot uh, deal with them this deal with the disorder. They they'll go to the the hospital afterward. Mm. So they're still quite popular these these yeah. folk in Taipei. Yeah, right. Okay, that's interesting. And they're doing more raw herb and that kind of thing. Yeah, but the yes. but but the government don't don't want to uh, focus that 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 mm. phenomena. Yeah, okay. and they are registered not in in the Ministry of Health but in the Ministry of Business. <laughs> oh, okay. So they're not they're not. <laughs> Classified are, as Chinese medicine doctors, they're classified no, as something else. The dispensaries. Dispensaries. <laughs> okay. Dispensaries. Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh, that's really interesting. And um, yeah, with your you guys, your training in the universities. Yeah. Uh, who were your Chinese medical mentors? Did you did you do it in quite a Western system? It sounds like you were in hospitals for quite a bit. Um, did you have I, any? Training outside of hospitals as well, or I do in the clinic. Uh, 
all the time. <laughs> mm. So, uh, but of course, my training, uh, our uh, formal training as a medical student, Chinese medical students, is in hospital. And the internship period, we spend our time in the hospital. But the hospital themselves actually is a department, a Chinese medicine department for the hospital. And the clinics actually just look like other clinic outside of the hospital. It's just the same. They are doing the same thing. Uh, they have acupuncture. They have uh, medicine, internal medicine. They they do a little bit of the traumatology, shanke. They do some manipulation for the patients. So I think actually there is not a lot of differences uh, between hospital and uh, clinics, but uh, maybe uh, gradually there's more differences because if you are in the hospital, you can do some governmental projects and you can get more um, pay by the project. So they are, they are not just doing the clinical uh, practice, they're still doing some research. Mm. So that I, I think that's the difference. And in my, uh, when I was in uh, the school, I learned Chinese medicine. I learned acupuncture from other teacher other than our school teacher. And it's a popular thing in Taiwan because um, we students think that um, the, the regular, the formal school education system is useless. <laughs> I, I would say that because they think um, most teachers, they are just reading the texts, reading the textbooks. And this is exactly the same criticism we had in mainland China. And I hear it in the West as well. So it's refreshing so they, to hear another place with the, the yes, same criticism. So they, they, <laughs> they go to other uh, clinical doctors. Maybe they um, being clerkship in their clinic. They just sit there and observe. And also they have uh, courses, for example, traumatology, shanke. They learn how to uh, do the manipulation. Uh, for example, how to treat the, uh, the, the backbone, how to uh, do the, how to deal with the limb problem. They, they need to learn from other teachers to get the knowledge, to, to get the techniques they want to learn. But because in the school, it is really hard for them to set the groups and actually teach them those te techniques. And they really don't have any chance to do acupuncture. They only um, attend the lectures, listen to uh, just watching the PowerPoint slides and see, oh, this is the certain point, and they don't really get the experience. Even they have clinical skill um, class, they only maybe just do 10 something acupuncture points and uh, that's all. So the, the clinical skill and uh, for example, like pulse check, uh, acupuncture, uh, traumatology, uh, um, manipulation, it's not enough in the school education. So people really uh, want to learn. So there's still, they even have the clubs to uh, get extra knowledge, you know, like, after the whole day course in the evening, start maybe from 7 p.m. They join the club uh, session and for like two hours. And so <laughs> actually learn something else. They, they say it's the actual uh, Chinese medicine class starts in the evening. So some people just skip the morning classes and they join the the 
extracurricular clubs to learn. Uh, they say real medicine, real Chinese medicine. <laughs> You're right. That's what it is. In my experience, is that uh, I'm I'm studying in the Chang'an University in the northern Taiwan, and when when I was in in my school time, the university they had invited the the uh, famous me- medical uh Chinese TCM doctor from mainland China, for example, Deng Zhongjia in Chengdu, uh, Medical University of Chengdu, and the. Uh, Hey, uh, Zhang Jin, the Chinese medicine, uh, univer- medical stu- uh, university in Heilongjiang. And they, they came to Taiwan and to teach or, uh, demonstrated that they pay the, do the demonstration. But I also, uh, enrolled the, the class, like le- lecture in the association of, of the, uh, Chinese lessons in, in Taipei to learn the extra knowledge about the uh, traumatology. And for the uh, Materna Medica, the, I, I connected to the, to the wholesalers of, of, of the herbs in Tainan, where, I, where, where my hometown. And I paid about, uh, I think four, uh, summer vacations. So about four years, uh, every, every vacation I went there and to uh, use my camera to make the records of every uh, herbs. How how's this uh, texture? How is it? How how the herbs like? Oh, amazing! Yeah, yeah nice. Yeah, I went to the dispensary to 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 learn and to learn the uh, herbs and also ask them. Or to inquire then how these herbs used in the in the in the folklore medicine or how the people used it in the in in the real life. So, so did, that, did you get did you get like a difference between what they said and then what you were reading in your textbook in class? Did you notice some some yeah, differences? Yeah, ma- many herbs are, are different. They have different um, vernacular names. Is different from the from the standard name. And sometimes the, uh, because our, uh, not, not only for Chang'e University, not only for our mentor, the, our textbooks also imported from in China. So there's some difference between the, the description of the herbs between in China and Taiwan and, mm. the, and the folklore medicine. So I, I think, I'm very grateful that my the boss, the businessman, they told me that four years that the 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 knowledge uh, aside aside from the university and aside from the textbooks. Yeah, I think it's 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 very important to get that hands-on education mm. part of your education as opposed to it all being intellectual mm. and all of that. Um, you mentioned, so doctors were coming from mainland China to teach you. So there's a bit of communication in the field between Taiwan and the mainland. I'm curious to what extent that kind of happens. How it happens. Uh, or how much, uh, how much it happens or yeah, because it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it also, uh, based on the, pol- uh, Political uh, phenomena, but sure. for 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 me, for in my experience, my the mainly the tutors from mainly China, they started from the nine nineteen nineteen nineties in uh to the 20 and tens, yeah. The at, at that period is the phenomena is more friendly, yeah. And the Chang'e University there, um. Uh, the chairman of of the of the co- committee, Wang Yongxin, who was the very uh, successful businessman, and he had the his his business is uh, between the Taiwan mainland China and the U.S. So he used he used his uh, influence to to invite many many Chinese. Chi- uh, many China's uh, doctors to Taiwan, and to so we used the uh, we used three months. It 
for for the contents the in for the in, in intense uh, course to learn from the many China's uh, tutors because they use the they they use the they use the name the, that they are come to Taiwan for travel for three months. So my our 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 course is more different from the Li's course. Mm. Um, okay. I think uh, also uh, there's some lectures invited by local uh, Chinese medicine associations because. Mm. Um, each county, for example, like Taipei City or New Taipei City, they have their own Chinese Medicine Association and all the uh, registered Chinese medical doctors in their city, they need to uh, join this association, it's compulsory. And so if you graduated, you um, basically you will be enrolled in one association and you, will be able to receive a lot of information from the association. For example, continuous education, they will uh, plan the schedule for the courses and you can uh, register, you can apply for the courses after your graduation. And um, I think, for example, I'm now in Taipei uh, associations, so they invite uh, lecturers from, in the past they invite a lot from mainland China, but now because the political uh, status is different, so there's less and less um, lecture uh, available uh, to come to Taiwan. And so basically they, invite those teachers uh, through their personal relationship. Because just as I mentioned, there are many special exam doctors. They, although they pass our uh, national special exam, they probably have a degree from China. For example, Guangzhou uh, yeah. um, Chinese Medicine School uh, or Nanjing, it just depends. So they have their personal re relationship, connect with the uh, men in China. So they can invite their former teacher or their friend to Taiwan and uh, ask them to give uh, maybe one week course or just single lecture and provide these courses for the uh, registered Chinese medical doctors. So everyone in Taipei, you can register, or even if you are in Taichung in other county, you can apply for the course. So it's a really uh, important uh, education uh, system after your graduation. You need to self-educate and uh, get more information, more knowledge for the Chinese medicine. Is there something I've heard a little bit about the postgraduate training in Taiwan. I don't know much about it. Maybe you could uh, elaborate it on it a little bit for our listeners out there. Um, it is a two year training in Chinese medicine. Um, the former name is called the Supervising Physicians Training Program of Traditional Chinese Medical Care Institutions. That means if you want to get ownership for the clinic, you need to finish the two-year training in the hospital or in the specific uh, clinic. And the system starts in 2014. So in the past, if you have two years of working experience, you register for two years, you automatically obtain the clinical uh, clinic ownership certificate. But now it's, it is not the case. You need to finish two year training after your graduation, after you, you uh, become a Chinese medical doctor. So uh, th there are of course a lot of problems with this system because there, there's never enough spots for the training program. And mm. the most graduates 
um, they want to join because of the certificate, but not for the training content them itself, because they think it's uh, basically repetitive courses similar to the clerk, uh, the internship. So it's really bothersome for for us. And I actually graduate in that year, 2014. So I, I, I didn't have the chance to join this program. So basically I don't have the uh, qualification to be the owner of a clinic. Yeah. All right, yeah, okay. Yeah. And I'm more fortunate that, to enter that project, but uh, I think that project is not for the how you to uh, business your, how to manage your, your clinic. It's more like to uh, cultivate you as a specialist doctor, the pre-specialist doctor, and also for the, the academic research. For example, they, we have to uh, read and also presentation for the SCI uh, papers to tell what's the updated uh, uh, scientific research in traditional Chinese medicines. And, and we also have to, like Li said, we have to re repeat our homework to, uh, in, in, in our in internship. We have to write the case report, write, it, write the case report in the, in the, in the form, but that form is from, is similar to the, to the Western medicines. But we just add the, we call it bin bin ji, the cause of the pathology and cause of the, and the mechanism of disease. But uh, expect that that is just like the, the Western medicines uh, uh, medical recorded form. And, and also we have to, uh, yeah, we have some, some we call it OSCE, the objective standard, uh, uh, objective, uh, objective standard evaluation, for that, that and that is also uh, transport from the Western medicines. Yeah. Mm. So, and, so is there much criticism, like vocal criticism, of this system in the field at the moment? Because you guys don't seem, neither of you seem too <laughs> happy about it. Yeah, uh, a lot. Because <laughs> yeah, because uh, it it I think it just used the used the candy coated with that. On, on, on that project, and they try, their they try to transform the the member in that project into the member in the medical center, not for the basic clinical uh, practitioner. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. So, so it's, it's very ironic. Yeah. Yeah. Ironic policy. We we all say it's useless for uh, doctors if you want to. Uh, be a clinical doctor in and work in the clinic is especially useless because the most uh, training program exists in the hospitals and they need to do all the reports, all the um, homework. Mm. And it's not very related to actual uh, clinical practice. So uh, for me, I uh, established an association to um, create a formal communication channel with the Department of Chinese Medicine and Pharmacy in the Ministry of Health and Welfare in Taiwan. So I was like, a, a keep working with the government and uh, kind of like want to communicate with them uh, what's the problem um, what we need. And of course, uh, we are glad they have a platform for the uh, applicants to match with the institute, uh, the training program institute. In the past, there's nothing. You need no. to call for the uh, uh, hospital. Ourselves. Yeah. Yes, you need to connect to uh, to the hospital or clinic to find out if they have a spot, if they have this program. And uh, it's very, uh, it's not efficient. Uh, 
so now they have a new platform and they try to match the needs, but we will see how they work in later in this year because this is the maybe the first year they use this platform formally. So we, we are still working with that. <laughs> I think the one of the one of the reasons for, for this problem is that the policy maker they are more uh, more focused on the medical center. They try to articulate the these traditional medicines to the in the regime of Western medicine. So they thought they thought that we have the the special the, the same form of the training program and the and the, the common uh, specialists, for example, the in, in in this year, yeah. Now nowadays they try to uh, build up a uh, further policies called the special Chinese uh, specialists in traditional Chinese medicine. They separated in in the internal medicines, the gynecological uh, medicine, gynecology and the pediat pediatric, pediatric, yeah, and traumatology uh, specialists. So, and acupuncturists, but, yeah, acupuncturists. <laughs> so they separate everything. Oh, so, but, so they won't separate initially in Taiwan because in mainland yeah, China, exactly. in China, mainland China, they're, they're mostly separate in most hospitals at, at the yeah, moment. Yeah. So in Taiwan, they weren't, but now they're moving they, in that direction. Yeah, it's yeah. not okay. in that direction. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Um, and well, good luck with it all. Um, it's I think it's a positive <laughs> thing that you've, Establish this association for communication. Um, yeah. How's it going so far? Do you feel um, we are able to join the uh, panel discussion, some small group uh, meetings, but actually we are kind of like observers. Uh, we we don't really have any right to decide anything. We can speak, uh, but uh, they are not really uh, incorporate our ideas, but uh, we still tried our best to connect to, for example, legislators and um, ask them to help us. Uh, they can um, give some pressure to the government and uh, ask them to um, kind of like more focus to our ideas, our advice, but that's all. Uh, but we, we, we are able to join the meeting. It's already a privilege, they think. Mm -hmm. So the things still moving toward their, uh, the direction they want. So they it's want to build build up the whole system of specialists in time. Yeah, right. And it sounds like uh, the people making these decisions aren't practicing clinicians. Is that right? They're not really practicing in clinics so much. They're quite removed from the day to day or do they have this kind of experience? They have the clinical experience, but they work in the medical centers. And, okay. And also, there became the there become the professor, the scholars, and the policy makers. So they, in my opinion, they are disconnected to the what the local practice is. Yeah, mm. and their their thinking is about the medical center. They have to incorporate the medical center and get their prestige, uh, and uh, per prestigious and the. Uh, they have to win, win their fame in the in the in the medical center and the government, but they they forget that the the eighty percent of uh, TCM doctors they all work in the local clinic, clinics, and this so their their project is not that fit for the all all the Taiwan's TCM doctors. So what we uh, arguments with 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 Lin Yi is that this project, this policy, is 
uh, is positive, but we have to make it more suitable and more equality equality to every every doctors. Yeah, it's not only just for the medical center. Mm. Yeah, but I I believe uh, in the end they there won't be um, <laughs> as many specialists like uh, we have the 7,000 something Chinese medical doctor now, but not all of us will be a specialist. Only probably a hundred could be the specialists in uh, according to the direction, according to their project. I can see uh, that is how things will be in the future, yeah. All right. Well, it sounds like you've got your work cut out for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I think we'll wrap up and leave it there, guys. But thanks for uh, thanks for all your time today, and yeah, letting people know a little bit more about what's happening in Taiwan in Chinese medicine in the field. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you for it. Uh, and thank you for your invited. <laughs> oh, it was my pleasure. I'd once again like to thank Ling Yi and Port Sun for taking the time out and joining us on the podcast and enlightening us with some perspectives from Taiwan on the training and practice of Chinese medicine there. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And on that note, we'll leave it there. Bye for now. See you next time.